What's up, everybody? So, Ashes of Malfo has been out for a little while now, and we're not quite ready to go into full spoilers yet, but I thought this might be a good time to go over some of the new characters that we got in the book and talk about their lore and their backstories. So, obviously, spoiler warning for the character bios that are in the back of the book if you haven't read any of those yourself yet. That's what we're going to be talking about here, but we're not going to spoil any of the story itself. One of the really cool things about this book and all the new models that we got is that a lot of them are named characters, which opens up the door for a lot of potential for extra backstory and maybe if Weird ever goes back towards having side stories and sort of one-off stories that don't focus on the big grand narrative and kind of get a little bit more into the individual characters, there's a lot more new interesting characters to feature in a story like that. I know for a lot of people those are their favorite types of stories, so this could be a good sign that we're going to be getting more stuff like that in the future. Fingers crossed. Now, we're only going to be talking about the characters that we didn't know about before this book came out. So if you want to know a little bit more about the pre-existing characters, then check out this video I did a couple of weeks ago that talks about where you can get more info about them. So with that, let's get right into the new characters, and we'll take them in order. So for Arn Rajput, we actually get a little blurb here, which is an interaction between him and Tony Ironsides. The two of them are sparring, and it seems to indicate that Arn is actually a trainer that Tony has worked with probably for some time now. Now, in Ironside's backstory, we know that she came up through, like, an underground fighting ring on Earthside. So maybe Aaron is actually the person who was training her when she was going through that whole process. That's kind of interesting because I would really like to know more about Ironside's early life. There's a lot of little hints that we get about things that went on with her family and what she was doing Earthside, but we don't really see her until she shows up in Malifo. Now, Aaron is obviously a martial artist, and he has some magical abilities, so it's not really clear if he has a direct connection to the MNSU or if it's just through his relationship with Tony that he kind of gets the keyword and works in the crew. But we also know that he has some relationship with Sandeep because he talks about Sandeep in this blurb. Now, the obvious connection to Sandeep may be that they knew each other from back in India before Sandeep came to Malifo, but I'd be curious to find out if there were more deeper connections between the two of them. Maybe they knew each other from the monastery that Sandeep was working at before the guild attacked or something along those lines. As far as his card goes, there's a lot of stuff here that is very thematic to the type of things that he seems to be involved with, but I don't really see anything here that's a deep lore connection or anything particularly interesting in that sense. The Elemental Boxers are a fun one for me because in 2nd edition, Ironsides actually came with the Oxfordian mages in her box. Now that was before the keyword system where things were sort of deliberately organized into like the little sub-factions like we have in 3rd edition Malifaux, but they came in Ironsides' box which sort of indicated that they were supposed to work together. And we also know from Ironsides' original story that she had a relationship with the mages. She liked to hang out with them because they were all kind of bookworms. And they liked to study together and read literature and play poker. But then when 3rd edition came out, the Oxfordian mages got removed from her quote-unquote crew. And they got switched over to Sandeep's crew. Which I guess makes a little bit more sense in some ways. But now we get the elemental boxers, which kind of bridge that gap again, which I think is kind of interesting. We get a little bit of info here about the fact that most of the MNSU doesn't really have magical abilities because they don't really have the time to sort of study and learn how to use magic. So Sandeep, in his role as the sort of mentor and teacher in the MNSU, has decided to start teaching some of the MNSU members to use a little bit of magic. If they only need to learn one or two spells, then it should be a little bit easier and more straightforward. And the elemental boxers are sort of the folks who have gotten good enough at doing a little bit of magic, but they're mostly still just... MNSU members. Now, their card is similarly very themed around the type of fighting that you expect them to do, but no real deep cuts in terms of lore references or anything like that. Sightless Snow and Cedra are two of the characters that I think really piqued a lot of the people in the community's interest when they were first shown off. They're really interesting looking models, and it's pretty cool that we get a little bit of insight into their backstory here, because I think that there's a lot that could be done with this in the future. Now, first of all, Sightless Snow has no relation to Snow of Snow Storm fame. Which I think is a little bit weird. I originally assumed that they were the same person because they're both part of Rasputina's crew and they're both named Snow. If you're not familiar, Snow was a silent one that sort of got wrapped up in some of the situation between Rasputina and December and was sort of empowered by part of December's essence. And now there's a big Wendigo monster named Storm and they're sort of bound together. So that's why that model always has the big monster and the silent one. But Sightless Snow has no relation to any of that. So her deal is that at some point in the past, she used to travel around the mountains, and she was a healer. And at some point, she was actually gifted a stag, known as Cedra, by the mountains themselves. It was meant to be her eternal companion. But then December showed up and brought with him the endless winter and famine. And when Sightless Snow was about to starve to death, she actually cut into Cedra and ate part of its body. 
Now, the creature was immortal, but for some reason it never came back to life after she finished feeding on it. But it turns out that Snow can actually sort of reverse this process by letting Cedra feed on her body, and then they switch places and Cedra comes back to life and Snow sort of stays in hibernation or stasis. It's extremely grim, uh, it's kind of horrifying, but I guess Malifaux. Now, in Snow's own bio, we get a little bit more information about her, and it seems like her thing now is that she likes to go around testing people. So when humans end up in the mountains in the north, and she finds them in desperate and starving situations, she will actually go and cook the dead and the dying, and then offer the meat to their companions as like a test of their will to survive. Also, really horrible. But I can definitely see why Rasputina and Marcus would both be super interested in these guys. Now, an interesting thing here is that we don't really know what time period this was taking place when Snow originally got Cedra and was kind of running around being a healer. But we know sometime after that, December sort of took over in the north. So this could be back in ancient times before the Tyrant War kicked off when the Tyrants were originally rising to power. Or it could have been during the first breach opening when the cults sort of formed in the north and December was let out of his prison the first time. It's often hard to say what the timeline is for a lot of these events because we don't get specific dates for most things and we just get these sort of little clues where we have to sort of piece it together ourselves. But drop a comment and let me know what you think. Is it more likely that this was happening in ancient times or was this happening during the first breach opening? Now across both of the models there are a bunch of abilities that are themed around December and the December cult and the mountains in the north where... He likes to hang out and spread his influence. But an interesting one to me is Primal Runes on Sightless Snow's card, which sounds kind of like a Euripides type of ability. Now we know that the Gigants actually went to the north and kind of lived up in the mountains for a long time, and they only very recently re-emerged and came back down to hang out with Titania. So I wonder if in the ancient past there's any connection between Sightless Snow and the Gigants. That would be kind of an interesting way to figure out exactly what the time frame is that we're talking about here. And it would also be interesting to see a connection between Euripides and Rasputina or Marcus because they kind of run around the same areas and it would make some sense for them to have encountered each other at some point. The Boilermaker was a normal construct until the Burning Man showed up and started spreading its chaos. So we know that it opens up portals between Earth and Malifaux in seemingly random fashion and one of those portals actually opened up right inside of the Boilermaker. It sort of developed a direct connection to the Burning Man and this fueled the construct and made it work over time and heat up and do all sorts of strange things. And then as the Burning Man returned to Earth, it kind of went back to being a normal construct until the Burning Man came back and then it went crazy again. This is kind of interesting because we only see the sort of chaos and corruption that the Burning Man normally spreads affecting people because they have a mind and kind of go crazy and become part of the cult. But here we see it actually influencing a construct in the way that it behaves, which is kind of cool. As far as the Boilermaker's card, the only particularly interesting ability on there is Call to the Burning Man, which is a common one we've seen across many different models. And as always, this is a bonus action that gives you a heal flip and burning one, which sort of represents embracing the Burning Man and succumbing to its influence, but there's always a downside to that. Unless, of course, you like having burning, in which case it's just dandy all around. Now, the Shadow Lark has made previous appearances, as I covered in that other video, but the Blackbirds did not appear in that Penny Dreadful. So these folks are new recruits who were hired by the Star Theater after its grand reopening after the incident that took place back at the beginning of 3rd edition. And they work as sort of stagehands, but they're also master thieves, and Colette uses them to go out on special missions where they need to be undercover and kind of hiding in plain sight. But it turns out that Damien Ravencroft cannot be fooled by their trickery, and so he has actually recruited some of them to work for him as well in a more unofficial capacity. Now, of course, they have a bunch of abilities that are sort of related to their work in the Star Theater, but one thing that's particularly interesting to note is their Thieves' Pocket ability. We actually find out in One Night at the Star, the Penny Dreadful one-shot, that the Shadow Lark has this sort of magical dimensional portal that she carries around with her that you can hold things in. It's basically a bag of holding from D&D, but it's in Malfo, so it's cooler. And for some reason, in terms of game mechanics, this gives you the ability to drop a scheme marker. I guess whatever they're holding in that pocket is useful for whatever job they're running. Makes some sense. Moss Beard and the Swashbucklers were members of Zip's crew, but they accidentally fell overboard from the infamous and landed in the bayou near the Sunken City. Now, the Sunken City was originally a sort of sister city to Malifaux City, and it was inhabited by the Sirens until it was destroyed very early in the Tyrant War. It sunk beneath the water, so now it is mostly submerged, but when Moss Beard landed there, he thought that he was alone, in spite of the fact that his companions were there. Apparently he had heat stroke, so he was going crazy. He started talking to a bottle of alcohol that he drew a face on called Rumson. Basically, it's the plot of Castaway, except there's other people there. He just doesn't know it. But what ends up happening is he ends up exploring the sunken city, and now he's sort of an expert on the place, 
and fighting off the sort of horrible creatures that inhabit that area, like mutated silverids and all sorts of other good stuff. But eventually he was found by the Clampets when he apparently tried to steal a boat from them, though he claims that he built the boat himself, and I guess you'll have to decide who you believe. Jebediah Jones is a gremlin that likes to tinker with machines, and when the beef between the Joneses and the Tuckets was getting worse and worse, he decided to create these little haberdashers, which are hats with guns in them, and offer them to both families as a peace offering. Now, you can probably guess what happened next, but they both just used these hats to murder each other and started sending requests to him for more of them because they thought they were very useful. So Jebediah kind of went with, if you can't beat him, join him, and he decided to just continue providing both families with weapons to kill each other. It's the most gremlin-y thing I've ever heard. Now, an interesting thing is that he used some of the parts that the gremlins had looted from the hollow point pumping station, which is also how Ma Tucket built her big construct that she rides around with in her title version. And both of these models have the ability Bayou 2 card, which is another ability that you'll see on lots of other characters. But fun fact, this is actually a reference to a story from the second edition of Weird Chronicles, so way back in the day before the game even existed. The story is called Bayou 2 card, and in it, Zerata plays a game of what we can assume is Bayou 2 card against a person so that he can try to win what he wants or she can cause him to come to some horrible end like she always does. And if you read through the story, it seems like it's basically just Texas Hold'em. So I guess that's kind of cool, although I think it would be kind of interesting if they had their own version of poker or a card game that they play that was popular in Malifo. We know that there's Bullet, which is a drinking, shooting, and card game that is popular as well, which sounds like a blast. But yeah, buy a two card, pretty much just regular poker. The Hog Oil Salesman is exactly what you think it is. Now, it's kind of interesting here because this isn't really a gremlin-y take on a real-life thing. This is kind of just a real-life thing. Snake oil salesmen have existed for a really long time. They still exist in various forms today. And basically, their deal is that they sell medicine to people, which really just poisons them or has all sorts of wacky things happen to them. I guess that's the gremlin -y angle, is the wacky bit. But the swine twirlers are basically just people who hold signs and... They are hired for things like bayou bashes to point people in the right direction, and also hog oil salesmen will hire them to make sure that people can find their shops and also use them as a decoy when everybody gets mad at them and tries to kill them. So Hopscotch is a giant toad, and he eats gremlins, because that's what you do in the bayou. And at one point he ate Houdini, but for some reason Houdini didn't die and eventually was spit back up by Hopscotch. Now not only was Houdini seemingly immune to being digested by the toad, but also he might have gotten high. It seems like he probably got high. Don't lick toads. So, like gremlins do, Houchdini decided to use some of the toxic coating on the outside of Hopscotch's skin to create shine, which sounds like a really good time. And Hopscotch, who was somehow irritated by the poison on its skin, which seems a little weird, but okay, uh, he kind of liked that Houchdini was scraping it off and using it for booze, so they got along great. Now, Kanehurst is a character that definitely piqued my interest when we saw the new stuff from Ashes of Malifaux, and unfortunately, we learn almost nothing about them. We know that they are very capable warriors, and as a result, Lord Cooper is super happy to let them work for him, and we also know that they are inhabited by a Nexus Parasite, because of course they are. We also know that they have some sort of strange connection with the Ahul, and it allows them to work very closely together and almost predict each other's movements when they're in combat. While we're speaking about the Ahul, we also get some new information about them and find out that this one seems to be immune to the Nexus Parasite for some strange reason. When it's bitten, it seems to have the ability to lower its body temperature and sort of freeze out the Nexus Parasite. So it's not able to fully take over and control the creature. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, then why not tell the YouTube algorithm how you feel by clicking the like button. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and maybe even sharing the video with some friends who you think might be into some Malifaux lore. Everybody should be into Malifaux lore, so send it to everybody. And if you're watching this video and thinking to yourself, hey, this book's been out for weeks and I've been wanting to talk about all this cool new lore that we've been getting for that whole time, but I had no one to talk to about it with, then you should come over and join my Discord because we talk about this stuff pretty much all the time. We talk about all kinds of other stuff Malifaux and not Malifaux related, but mostly we talk about Malifaux lore. So if that sounds cool, then definitely come over and join us. There'll be a link for that in the description below, along with a whole bunch of other important things, like my weird affiliate link. If you'd like to purchase a copy of this book, you can do it through that link, and it'll be the same cost to you, but your purchase will actually support this channel on the back end. On top of that, you can check out the Patreon, where we have 
all sorts of different tiers with all sorts of different benefits so that you can get things like early access to the videos, you can get videos without this part in the middle where I interrupt the video and talk to you about all these things. You get extra entries in the giveaways that I do occasionally and all sorts of other stuff. So definitely check that out and I appreciate any support that you can give me. But with that, let's get back to that delicious lore. The Slipstreamer is obviously an Awa, which is a form of Fey from Ancient Malifo. And they've sort of lost a lot of their technology and culture, but they're now reclaiming it as they've sort of reemerged in the recent history. One of the bits of technology they were able to find are these little floaty hovercrafts that they apparently used to use to spread messages around the ancient world between the different groups of Fae that were kind of spread out in different areas. So once they recovered these things, they actually sent some of them down to Maxine, who found them interesting and sort of incorporated some of the Awa into her crew. They have the ability Scars of Shirufe, which is a reference to the curse that the tyrant put on the Awa, and it caused their skin to sort of decompose and turn into ash over time, unless they stayed near a source of heat. He seems like not a very nice guy. Has zero chill. Casey Jones was an employee of Condor Rails, and he signed a lifetime contract, but then he died in a horrible accident. Everybody thought he was just gone, but then Jedza ended up in the area, and because of her weird ability to sort of reanimate dead things. It sort of fused his essence with pieces of the train that blew up in this accident and created what we see here in the art, which is kind of cool. But of course, Anya being the horrible person that she is, she decided, well, he signed a lifetime contract, so I guess he still works for me. And you thought you had a terrible loss. Now, Casey Jones is actually a real historical figure, and I encourage you to go read about him because it's a really interesting story. But as far as the lore deep cuts go here, there isn't really much but just a fun little thing, a whippoorwill, I looked up when I saw this ability, and it turns out that that is a bird. And according to American folklore, when you hear its song, it's supposed to indicate that someone is going to die. And of course, this model is also a little bit of a reference to Vagrant Song, a board game by Weird, with the number on the front of the train matching the one on the art from that game. And of course, Vagrant Song is filled with references to American folklore and legends, so this is another cool little tidbit that kind of ties them in together. If you want to know more about that, then check out the interview I did with Kyle from Weird on that very subject when they were doing their last Kickstarter for Vagrant Song, which is set to ship pretty soon now. The Alleyway Echo is definitely a favorite of mine. So this is a creature that sometimes guards Widdershin's Lane. Way back in first edition, we got the story that introduced the Ten Thunders and the Library of All Things, which eventually part of it became the Red Library with that we know now. And in that story, the characters travel to Widdershin's Lane, which is this strange place that can connect any part of Malifaux to a different part of Malifaux. It's kind of like a magic wormhole. But the catch is, it is usually guarded by some sort of horrible creature that will either try to kill you or make some sort of bargain with you that probably won't work out to your advantage. In that story, they manage to sort of distract the creature long enough that they are able to get away. But the alleyway Echo, strangely, seems to ask for relatively simple things from people that are trying to transit Widdershin's Lane. People don't think much of it, but it turns out that it is collecting objects that are tied to fate or magic in some way for its own nefarious purposes that we don't know about yet. Hostukat's another fun one. He lived in Louisiana and was fond of collecting interesting and magical artifacts. But oftentimes these things were cursed, and eventually he ran afoul of the voodoo gods who put a hex on him. He ran away to Malifaux and continued the reckless practice in spite of the horrible circumstances he found himself in. And it turns out that he got hexed so many times that the hexes sort of worked against each other and spared his life in the process. So now he just keeps doing it, I guess. If it worked once and it worked twice, then why not keep going? And we see in the art here he has a Hushabai cloak as well as a Casa Obake, which are both horrible, horrible things that you should never try to interact with, and he's just kind of casually rocking around with both of them. I'm sure that's going to go great for him in the future. But, again, it's worked out good so far, so why not? Oh, and his ability, Fanged Edge Umbrella, is obviously a reference to the Casa Obake, which is a umbrella with teeth. The Hand of Janus is a construct that was built to be Gretchen Janus's personal bodyguard, Gretchen Janice is the current leader of the Explorer Society, and while she's not a character in the game itself, she has been around in the lore since pretty much as soon as the Explorer Society became a thing in the game. Now, this construct has all sorts of strange and interesting abilities, and we also get a little note here that Tiri seems to find it kind of familiar, which kind of hints that maybe it has a little bit of Awa technology in it. But I'd be curious to find out how that's the case if Tiri didn't help her with it. Maybe Parson was helping her out on the side and didn't tell Tiri about it. Who knows. 
Now, the interesting question here is whether or not Janice's Wrath, this giant hammer that the Hand of Janice seems to be holding, is a Relic Hammer. It has sort of similar abilities to Relic Hammers, but not exactly. And it's hard to say whether it looks like a Relic Hammer or not, because they always look kind of different. But we do know that Janice has some Relic Hammers in her repository of cool things in her basement. So it's entirely possible that this thing is wielding a Relic Hammer, which would be very cool. If you want to learn a little bit more about Relic Hammers, I have a short video that I did a while back going over everything we know about Relic Hammers up until that point. So we've learned a little bit more since then, but not, not a whole lot. Aval Ortega is a cousin of a lot of the other Ortegas that you already know. And when he came over to Malfo, he found it a little bit boring, which seems crazy because it's filled with monsters. But hunting monsters didn't really do it for him, so he just kind of hung out and chilled until Harold Tull showed up. And Harold Tull is known for a lot of things, but one of them is definitely not being boring, and Abel was pretty excited about it. Plus, that's where he met Domingo Montoya, who was an early recruit of Tolls once he came over to Malfo, and the two started dating and eventually got married. That's actually the first example of a gay male character that we know of so far in canon, which is pretty cool. So Domingo Montoya was actually recruited by Tull after the guild forced him to relax their recruiting standards because originally King's Empire would not allow them to recruit anyone who was not from the King's Empire. So he had a whole bunch of people that he wanted to recruit, and Domingo Montoya was a Mexican operative who was doing some sort of spy craft type things in a secret military organization, and Toll snatched him up real quick. And now him and his husband usually get deployed at the same time because they seem to be pretty good at blowing stuff up together. The Nightcrawler Network was a dude who was putting cameras all around Malifo and spying on people. And when Gil found out about this, they weren't too happy, but he promised to sell them information to help them further their goals and never to sort of work against them. And they kind of let him do his thing. So he hides these camera bots around the city, and sometimes he'll even put them in places where they're super obvious so that people will avoid them and then let their guard down where the more well-hidden cameras can get all the information that he needs. The Ashbringers are agents that work for the Witch Hunters and the Death Marshals, and their specialty is destroying undead remains as well as magical artifacts and grimoires that give mages their magical ability. They mostly use fire magic, and Director Rodriguez was a guy from Spain who they recruited to lead them because he's got a particularly hardline stance against magic users and necromancers especially. He doesn't really like that a lot of the people in the guild are using this kind of magic, but for now he's sort of focusing on the bigger problem and he's going to worry about that later. Commander Burra is the protege of Governor General Marlowe. She's a decorated career soldier and she leads this vanguard unit, which are a little bit more highly trained and a little bit more professional than your average guild guard, who are kind of just out there being bullies on the street. Marlowe has taught her to be an expert in using magic, especially his ability to create shields and barriers. Bracer is the second in command of the Vanguard unit, and in contrast to Burra, she's particularly brash and combative. But they work well together, and their sort of opposite extremes seem to complement each other, and Bracer is the part of the unit that focuses mostly on defending the other members. The Battering Rams are sort of the foot soldiers of the Vanguard unit, and they're known for wearing a helmet with the symbol of the guild, a ram's head, when they go into battle. Just like the rest of the unit, they are known for their high level of discipline, and they've been used especially effectively in the quarantine zone, which is the very dangerous and crazy part of the city. The guild is, of course, quite well known for their propaganda. They have an entire division of the organization devoted to spreading propaganda and regulating different ways that information might spread, both through newspapers as well as Etherox broadcasts, and they pretty much own the newspapers that are in distribution around the city. And another way that they spread their propaganda is through propagandists. These are people who literally just go out in the streets and spread their message and they even stand on top of these constructs to try to spread their message further and make sure that everybody has to hear what they have to say. The Crookskins are mimics who have sort of stayed in a more feral state. They can't transform into humans, they can only imitate beasts and monsters. And they also seem to transform unpredictably and in strange ways. They're also the only beings that can navigate the change paths, which are a strange area of the Knotwoods that even Titania doesn't know where they go. Delirium was created when an insidious madness was feeding on the crazed thoughts and insanity of a person whose mind was entirely broken. Somehow this interaction allowed it to develop a personality, and it soon found that it could replace scenes from the memories that it had consumed, and even manipulate reality in certain ways. When Delirium gets its hands on someone and drains everything out of them, they become a delirious thrall. They lose all sense of identity, and Delirium can actually replace their identity with different ones. And if they try to resist this process, it only makes it worse for them. The Leech King is not a king at all, and in fact is a pauper. But wherever he goes, he's a herald of sickness and decay. 
he has knowledge of all the oldest places around Malfo, and again, this makes me wonder, which era of Malfo's history does he actually come from? The two moons of Malfo were very important to the ancient Neverborn, and the Sirens in particular started worshipping the moons and their influence over the tides as well as the flow of magic. The Sizigi sisters are two in particular who don't really look like their Siren ancestors anymore, but each of them is sort of empowered by one or the other of the moons. Now, they have an ability called Fallow Night, and this is a reference to a very rare occurrence where neither of Malfo's moons rise over the night. It doesn't happen very often, but it's said that this is when portals will open between Earth and Malfo, and in ancient times, that's how a lot of species were able to move back and forth. But these events were very important to the Neverborn, and this is when a lot of different rituals and hunts and things like that would take place. But they're particularly hard to keep track of, and most of the knowledge of the Dreaming Ones is lost, so it's something that is not easy to do. V and Herbert were scavengers that worked for Leviticus, but they were also engineers in their own right. They were inspired by the Badlands Invitational, which is a three-day rally race in the Badlands of Malifo, and they decided to try to make their own automobile. So they strapped an engine to Herbert's wheelchair and made him go real fast. Which sounds like a ton of fun, except that he disappeared for some reason for three seconds. Now, as with all things obliteration, the three seconds for Herbert were quite a bit longer, and when they came back, they found Aeonis, who was chastising them for manipulating time. They didn't really know what happened, but Tara became quite interested and asked them to help her to try to recreate whatever it was that they did. Dr. Silas was researching blood diseases, and he became particularly intrigued by black blood sickness, which is what happens to normal humans when they're exposed to black blood. So he started experimenting on inmates with black blood and exposing them to it to see what would happen, but unfortunately he accidentally infected himself with it. He thought he found a cure, and then when he tried to treat himself, it actually made the problem worse, and it started disfiguring his body in the way that we see in the art. So obviously he realized that the guild was not going to be too happy about this, so he fled and ended up in Beggar Tree, which is a section of the quarantine zone where he could do a little bit more research without being bothered too much. Trial and Error were two of his test subjects who were also affected by the Black Blood Sickness, and they ended up in Beggar Tree as well where they're helping Dr. Silas, and when they're not working for him, they're just kind of standing around and being annoying, which I think is pretty funny because they're these horrible disfigured monsters, and they're also kind of obnoxious and do bad impressions of people. Hey, we finally got more lore about Ampersand, which is one of my favorite places in Malfo. The Sixth-Armed Six Shooter was a strange construct that kind of wandered into Ampersand, which is this place where rogue constructs and robots who betrayed their masters kind of flee to live their own lives and outside of the watchful eye of the guild. It was strange and it didn't like to tell anybody where it came from until one day when Ella Mae Chesterfield was being attacked and it kind of snatched up some of her guns and started shooting and it turns out it's a pretty good shot. So Ella Mae decided to sort of retrofit it with some extra arms and now it rocks around with her as a gunslinger like the Old West, except it's a robot, which is way cooler. I'm all about it. I don't even play Yellow, but with this book, I'm, I'm going to have to. The Bad Omen, as Swarmlord pointed out, seems to be this creature from a Parker story that was following Doc Mitchell around that is basically just what it sounds like in the name, a Bad Omen. Now it stalks its way around the Badlands, following its targets, and it is an indication that that individual is doomed. Sometimes it appears as a fiery hound, and sometimes it appears in this Anubis-looking form that we see in the art here. I really like this model, but I kind of want to see what the fiery version of it looks like. It would have been cool if this came in like a two-pack. Dr. McMorning and Professor Von Stuck are both gross, and when they're working on a project, they discard pieces of people and other creatures and just kind of throw them into the sewer. Well, because they're doing necromancy and some of that magic is sort of lingering around, sometimes these discarded parts will form into a construct that then sort of moves around and tries to accumulate more organic mass. And that's exactly what a last bite is. It's just a big hunk of stuff that's trying to accumulate more stuff. This might sound familiar. A bisection is basically just a part of that. It can either grow into a leftovers, or if a leftovers falls apart or gets damaged, it can split into a bisection. And the last bite is exactly that, but for the bisection. If you split it again, it's this teeny little immobile version of this jelly puddle. It's very gross in exactly the right way. The Keepside Strangers are necromancers who live in Stranger's Keep, and they're kind of isolated from the rest of the Rezor community, as well as the rest of Malifo City. Normally we think of Resurrectionists as being these creepy weirdos, but these people are a little bit more aristocratic and fancy looking. And what makes them interesting is that they're not quite as focused on raising the dead as they are on controlling the living, which is an interesting twist on a necromancer. They have been joined by the strange lady who is now sort of their leader, and she seems to be on a mission to recover the Gorgon's Tear. 
She obviously looks just like Medusa, which is what the Gorgon seems to look like. And it kind of projects an image of what looks like Medusa in certain circumstances in the lore. And we don't know exactly why she's looking for the Gorgon's Tear, but she seems to be aware of who has it and who has had it in the past. So that's why she's working with Molly and Seamus, because it's still in Seamus' head. If you don't know what the Gorgon's Tear is, it's basically a soul stone where one of the tyrants known as the Gorgon is trapped. And it was the focus of a lot of the early lore, and eventually it was shoved into Seamus' face to bring him back to life after he died. Botch and Amelie were a couple who were both researchers that came through the breach during the first breach opening. They were doing research into mushrooms and fungus, and they were super reckless and died in the bayou, because that's what happens if you go in the bayou. But instead of just rotting and disappearing, they actually had their internal organs and things replaced with a mycelium network, which is super creepy and reminds me of The Last of Us, and that's not scary at all, but... Now, they've sort of risen back up and are controlled by the fungus. But for some reason, they're still in love with each other, so there must be a little piece of them that's still alive in there somewhere. That's kind of scary and horrifying and fascinating all at the same time. But they had also taken a research team with them, and some of them met the same fate, and that's where we get the Dapperlings, who were also sort of brought back by the fungus. Oscar is another story. They don't seem to remember Oscar being part of their team. He just kind of showed up and was this big giant thing. And they decided to take him along because he was helpful. And when he does good, they call him Button, which is adorable. There's something very funny to me about giant monsters who have cute nicknames. I don't know why, but I like it. Plague Pickers were constructs that were used by the guild in the quarantine zone to collect bodies, especially to avoid the Piper's Plague. Eventually, they decommissioned most of them, but some were kind of lost, and one of those is Old Hob. It just kind of wanders around the quarantine zone, acting like a child and chasing butterflies, and sometimes picking up dead bodies. And most people just leave it alone because it's prone to do murder sometimes and stick people on the spikes on his back, which seems really unpleasant even by the standards of the quarantine zone. Sen gained a reputation around the Little Kingdom as a lounge singer, and eventually her reputation spread so far that the Thunders got word of it. They suspected that she was actually lacing magic into her songs because they were so captivating that she could get people to do anything she wanted when she sang for them. So pretty soon she was recruited to work at both the Honeypot Casino and the Key and Gong, and her singing abilities sort of synergized with both of those establishments pretty well. K-O-T-O, or King of the Octave, or Koto, which I think is what everyone's going to call him, is a construct that works at the Key and Gong playing music. Its large physical form and multiple arms make it able to play instruments in ways that most humans couldn't, so it's become a pretty popular attraction for guests. And the best part is that anybody who messes with him soon finds out that he will also beat the hell out of you. So that's always cool. So he definitely fits right in at the King Gong. Ban Ying was trained at the Four Rivers Temples, which are where Shen Long and his buddies train in the different elemental styles that we see in the game. Ban Ying was so skilled that he started to develop the ability to manifest his thoughts. And eventually he was actually cross-trained in the Ansatsu Dojo, which is where the Ten Thunders train their most skilled assassins. This kind of bridges the gap between the Katanakas and Shenlong and his dojo, which is an important relationship because up until this point, they haven't really been as closely tied together as you might think. One of the things he actually developed was the ability to split his shadow off into different forms called sunless selves, and they actually act independently of him sort of thinking like he would, sort of doing their own thing, and he doesn't actually have to actively control them. He can actually manifest himself in any one of them, so he has the ability to sort of surround and outnumber an opponent, but also he can jump around and appear inside of any one of those shadows to strike and surprise an opponent. Cool ninja stuff. And finally, we have Zhang. I looked up how to say that, so don't at me. This statue was discovered in the tomb of an ancient Chinese emperor, and eventually it made its way onto the black market where the Ten Thunders got their hands on it. They studied it and found out that it was actually enchanted with magic, and if they activated it, it would actually come to life and do their bidding. But they kind of have to keep it a secret because if the current empress of China found out that they had it, she'd probably be pretty pissed. But they're still looking for where it originally came from because the tomb is rumored to have 10,000 more just like it. And that's it for all of the new characters in Ashes of Malifaux. I gotta tell you, I didn't think that was gonna take that long, but it was a ton of fun. I really like a lot of these new characters and I'm super excited to see where they go in the story in the lore of Malifaux. Drop me a comment below and let me know which of these is the most interesting to you and if your answer to that question would have changed from before you watched this video. Stay tuned to the channel because we are definitely going to be talking more Ashes and Malifaux in the near future. But with that, I want to say a huge thank you to the Extremely Cool Kids tier on Patreon, the Steam Powered Scoundrels, Dogmatize, Devin, and the Spilled Paint Pot. And thanks for watching.